Hey, welcome back to another episode of e-commerce on tap brought to you by Sourceify. I'm your host, Nathan Resnick. And today we're joined by Robert Brill from Brill Media. Robert, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Nathan. Appreciate it. So I want to first start by learning more about you. I know you're based in LA. You've been running Brill Media just over 10 years. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So you've seen the highs and lows of media buying. You've seen the landscape change quite a bit. I want to learn more about your background, how, how Brill started and then what kind of your main focus is at Brill today in terms of the clients you serve and type of businesses that work with Brill. Yeah, of course. So uh, thanks for having me, Nathan. Um, let's see, I started working in uh, marketing and advertising 20 years ago and uh, at Universal Music. We were doing, um, it was called guerrilla marketing at the time, but it was basically social content posting um, before social media was a thing. And then um, went to Universal McCann working on Sony Pictures. And then uh, 2013, had some experience with programmatic ad buying, so buying ads across the open web. And uh, 2013 started Brill Media with the goal of um, making search, social, display, connected TV, all that stuff available to uh, small and mid-sized advertisers, uh, advertisers who don't have tens of millions of dollars to go to a big ad agency. And here we are today celebrating our 10-year anniversary um, for our business. And, you know, a lot of our business comes as a, we're a white label media buying firm for other agencies. So um, we typically pair up with uh, creative firms and they, and, and general marketing firms, some social media firms, influencer marketing firms. They'll pair up our services with theirs and we'll go to market as, you know, creative plus media buying and we also take on our own clients when they come come across our desk as it were um, and we do everything uh, search social programmatic connected tv and we do e-commerce lead generation um, most of what we do has some level of performance to it it's got to be that way makes sense that's awesome well i think creative goes hand in hand with any sort of media buying and advertising so it makes a lot of sense because if you don't have a great creative your ad's not going to perform. And, and so I want to, I guess, start the conversation there around how you've seen creative evolve yeah. over the past 10 years and what you see working best today from a creative standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, my perspective is creative is king, media is queen. Uh, I didn't coin that phrase. Someone else did. I don't know where. And um, when we talk about creative, you know, What's interesting is pairing up data-driven decisions with creative creative decisions. And the most important place to do that for me is on Meta, right? So um, a lot of a lot of what Facebook wants you to do with their advertising is kind of like outlined in the performance five. And broad targeting paired with creative testing. So age, gender, and location paired with creative testing. So you give Meta's algorithm a chance to find your best customer. And that's particularly important because I mean, Meta has data on all of us for 10 to 15 years and it knows when we put things in our add to cart and then, and then drop, drop off. Um, so I've seen it firsthand recently where I put something in, in an add to cart and see a competitive ad for a competitive brand. So, um, it's real, it's happening, and I think the best thing e-commerce advertisers can do is to grow their ad accounts is um, let, you know, train Meta's machine learning algorithm. And that comes by driving a lot of different creative tests such that you allow Meta to find the products and services that your customers like. So rather than um, being on that you know, the, 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 the treadmill for meta is you create an ad with a, or you create an ad or you create a, a keyword interest target, et cetera. And it works for two and a half weeks. And then you try to scale it and then it, it falls apart and you're on this cycle again and again and again, and you have tens or hundreds of different ad groups. And, um, there's a better way to do, to do meta advertising. And it's not by cycling through keyword and interest groups. It's much more about cycling through creatives. So we have a creative testing framework that we do every three to four weeks and um, start with five ads. Those five ads turn into uh, 125 different ad variations if you strip away the headline, the image or video and text. Uh, so you have basically 15 different elements and you mix and match those elements 
you have 125 different ad variations. You do control variable testing. And within two days, you can find your top 20 ads, ad variations. And within a, the course of a total of two to three weeks, you have your one best ad, your all-star ad out of all 125 variations. And that way, over the course of a few months, you understand the products, the services, the discounts, the audiences that really resonate with your business. And you move away from that keyword-driven treadmill that just never lasts. Makes sense. I'm curious, kind of diving into the creative side. I've heard and I've seen that, you know, if you update a video clip, just the first kind of hook, the first five, 10 seconds, you know, updating that hook can actually drastically change the performance of that ad. And so I'm curious, you know, if you've seen that to be the case, how often should companies be refreshing that hook or changing that hook? And, you know, I, I think it gets to be pretty obvious when an ad becomes stale. What have you seen an ad kind of get rejuvenated by updating that hook? We've seen a little bit of that. We're not, you know, we're looking for big dramatic changes in creative. We're not, we're actually not looking for the minor changes. Now, I've seen what you're describing. I've seen it happen. But, you know, our, our advice to clients is either have us create ads every three to four weeks or you create ads every three to four weeks. But, like, that's it. And you're always iterating. And there may be a point where you, for example, start with image ads and you, you identify your best image ads and then you turn them into video ads with the same general message look and feel, right? That's one way to do it. Um, but yeah, like, you know, we're, we're doing a, a, a version of that testing with our own content on TikTok where we take the same video, open it up to different starting points in the video make it more or less punchy and we look at performance. Typically what works, you know, when we're running e-commerce, we're seeing combinations of like glossy videos, like really well-produced videos like that just catch users' attention. We like to run ugly ads because ugly ads oddly work. Um, we like to run UGC or influencer content. Those work really well. Um, and I don't, I don't care what works. I don't have to be the arbiter of, of quality. The the consumer does. Right. So we want to give the consumer choices, the perception of choices, right? You're going to get the products, you're going to get the services. But, you know, some people like consuming long-form video and some people like consuming short-form video, animations versus video versus images, long-form text, short-form text, positive messaging, negative messaging. So we want to give consumers all the variation that they need. So the people who like long form text get the ads for long form text. I don't want to limit my ads to a certain type. And that's how we pair up the sort of real time focus group nature of advertising with what works best in the marketplace right now, understanding the algorithm, et cetera. Makes sense. I mean, I think, like you said, dialing in creative and continuing to update creative every three or four weeks is a key for an e-commerce brand. I'm curious, you know, when it comes to media buying in that side of the business, you know, what kind of split do you see or do you think should be focused on, you know, kind of retargeting versus going out and trying to acquire, you know, new customers through a broad audience? Like, do you have any kind of guidelines or, you know, I don't want to say rules, but I guess any kind of feedback or advice that you've seen in terms of, you know, hey, I think rule of thumb, you know, 30% of your budget should be spent on retargeting and 70% should be spent on, you know, a broader audience trying to acquire new customers. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different market dynamics at play. So we don't we don't have a rule of thumb. I mean, in many cases, we can't spend 30% of our budget on remarketing. There's just not that many people, right? So we have to spend far more of our budget on prospecting. So that's number one. Um, typically, what we like to do is get those creative learnings from Meta. And in a lot of cases, we're not even doing remarketing. We're doing broad targeting. No keywords, no interest, no lookalikes, no remarketing. We let the algorithm get our ads in front of the right people. But there are situations where we do run remarketing specifically on Meta. Um, we do a lot of remarketing with banners and um, even some Google ads and Connect TV and, and other platforms. 
remarking to us really comes down to what are you trying to accomplish? Is your goal to squeeze customer acquisition costs, right? Because it depends on who you work with. Like if you're working with a mid to senior brand manager and they get a bonus because they lowered customer acquisition costs, if that's who we're serving, that's who we're serving. If we're working with a business owner, we try to espouse the benefit of looking at starting more consumer journeys. What we care about is actual source of truth sales. Like, what does your accounting team see? Like, does your accountant see that more dollars are flowing in? Right. But if that's the case, when we look at holistic source of truth sales, it may not be the right thing to lower customer acquisition costs because you're just squeezing customers that were already in market anyway. And maybe they would have bought a week from now instead of today. So that actually is not a true indicator of success. I encourage our team to think like business people. It's your money. It's your business. Like, what's best for the business? And then we adjust based on the needs of the CMO, the business owner, the brand manager, whatever the case might be. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. You, you, you talked about, you know, kind of, I guess, the source of truth, right? And I think that's a big question mark for a lot of brands that are advertising because, you know, the Facebook pixel often reports differently than, you know, what you're seeing or what, you know, a Google pixel is saying or whatever it may be. How do you navigate that in terms of, you know, what is the source of truth? Yeah, I mean, the actual source of truth is how many sales you got. Like, literally, like, the person who counts how many orders went out this week, like, that's the source of truth. It, it doesn't matter what the attribution that Facebook says. It doesn't matter the attribution that um, Banners or Google say. What matters is how many actual sales came in. So there's, but to further expand on that, there's the inexpensive way with less data fidelity, which is very good. And then there's a far more expensive way with a lot more data fidelity, but it's very expensive. Every, everything tracks down to how many sales were generated across the organization, just period, um, daily, weekly, and monthly. And you look for trends over time. And the trends that we're looking for is, you know, on Facebook for, or Meta, for example, we can start, we can, there's two things we can do. We can start more consumer journeys, or we can we can scoop up customer demand. Scooping up customer demand looks good on paper, but the reality is you may have you may be scooping up demand that was there anyway. But I can start more consumer journeys. My customer acquisition cost looks bad, but on the source of truth, the actual number of sales are are increasing. So the challenge is how do we know what's working and what's not? The inexpensive ways you look for trends over time, you look at attri attributable sales across channels, you compare it with what's actually happening, and you make decisions, and you, and you consistently run tests for your advertising campaigns. The expensive way is to spend twenty to $100,000 a year on systems, customer data platform like Twilio Segment, uh, attribution, and, and consumer journey like Triple Whale. Um, and you, you know, you have an opportunity to really dive into deduplicating those conversions because you will have duplicated conversions. So low tech and, and high tech, low fidelity, high fidelity, there's an option for everyone. And it's really just a matter of your like general philosophy of a business. Would you yeah. run a hundred thousand, twenty to a hundred thousand dollars measuring, sorry, measuring your data, or do you want to spend 20 or a hundred thousand dollars getting more media and market and having less fidelity, but still driving sales. Right. I, I think it's interesting because you have a really good, good point where a lot of these brands spend quite a bit of money on a tool like, you know, triple whale or whatever it may be to understand, you know, their, their analytics and their data. And that, you know, in essence could be done just by understanding, you know, how many sales did I get in this period and how much did I spend on, you know, these certain channels. Right. Um, and like you're saying, you could potentially go spend that, you know, 100K that you're spending on this software to then go actually increase top line and, and get more customers. So it's a really interesting, I think, dichotomy that not many brands think about because they think, you know, I think a lot of people have this belief that, you know, it's all in the data and you need these tools to understand your data. But, you know, if you 
can read a Excel sheet or understand how many customers you've got in a certain time period and understand how much you spent, you can decipher your CPA pretty easily, right? And so I think you have a really strong yeah. point there where maybe sometimes people overcomplicate um, <laughs> their their source of truth. And it it's also it's also dependent upon how complex your consumer journey is, right? We have some clients where, you know, like where there are application systems, not for e-commerce necessarily, but like leads generated, but then there's a complete other software, backend software system that tracks an application for like university or something. Then you need more depth and insight into the consumer journey. Um, but, you know, look, the reality is that we are in a world where data in advertising is uh, we have lower fidelity data um, and there are models being built to understand when a conversion happens. But there's so many, there's so many executives in the marketplace who are out there who either don't want to accept that reality or it doesn't work in their favor to accept that reality. So their, their key, their key storyline is about how they're going to they're going to get much higher fidelity data by spending million, you know, hundreds of twenty to a hundred thousand dollars a year on data, and that's good for a big company. Like big companies need that, but that's how you start to get like oddly bloated, you know, organizations. Yeah. Um, so you know, we're we're here to advise on both case in both cases. Makes sense. Well, Robert, thank you for coming on e-commerce on tap. If people want to get in touch or find more out about Brill Media, where can they reach you? <laughs> yeah, uh, brillmedia.co. That's B as in boy, R-I-L-L media.co. And if you want to talk about your advertising strategy, hit the contact us button, leave me a message, and you can, you'll be prompted to schedule a time uh, on my calendar. Awesome. Robert, thanks again for coming on e-commerce on tap brought to you by Sourceify. And thank you everyone for tuning in to this episode.